Okay, uh, back for another live stream here, and what I'm going to cover in this one is working on some homework for inverses of functions. So um, what we're going to do is I'm just going to kind of work through step by step how to find the inverse of a function, and um, as well as determine, as you can see, the domain and range. And we, so we have about four different functions that we're going to work on uh, doing that. I'll also talk about uh, proving uh, functions are inverses of one another. And then kind of we'll look into some multiple choice uh, examples that um, you, know, you might you know, encounter and kind of how to work through those. Um, then uh, after I'm done with that, if you have any questions or anything else that you want to add to the stream, I will be more than happy uh, to answer those and you know, kind of work them out uh, as much as I can. So you know, I have about 20, 25 minutes that I'm going to look into plan on spending for this. So hopefully it doesn't take too much longer than that and we can go ahead and get started. All right, so determine the domain range of the following functions by determining the inverse. So, you know, one thing we looked in class was looking at, uh, you know, a function and its inverse of the graph. And what we noticed is that the points were swapped as well as the domain and ranges were swapped. So what I'm really trying to drive home with this is if you're trying to look for the, uh, the, the domain and range of a function, well, the domain and the range are the range and the domain of the inverse function. So we can use the inverse to help us to identify the domain and range of the original function as needed. And I think that will be most helpful here in this last example, whereas some of these we can already define the domain and range just by looking, but just by knowing the graph. All right, so a couple things. Let's kind of look. These are all in function notation. So one of the first steps that we looked at to identifying the range was replacing f of x with y. Now, this is not really a necessary step, um, but I think it's much more helpful to algebraically work with y than it is with x. So the first step is if you have it in function notation, replace it with y. And then the second step is to replace the x and the y, or swap them. And again, this is kind of makes sense when you look at the graph, the points x, y are swapped for the inverse function. Now, the next step is to basically go ahead and solve for y. So to solve for y, I'm just going to use my inverse operations here. I'm going to subtract a 5 on both sides. And then I have x minus 5 is equal to 4y. Then I'm going to divide by 4. And therefore, I have x minus 5 divided by 4 is equal to y. Now, you could write it like this, and your answer might be written that way. Actually, I'm sorry, the last step. We were talking about f of x, right? So I'm going to flip these back around. I'm going to use function notation. So I'm going to write this as f, don't be slow on me, f inverse of x is equal to x minus 5 over 4. But then when I talk to my students, you might see this on a multiple choice example. So the multiple choice might write it like this, but dividing by 4 is the same thing as multiplying by 1 fourth. So it could be written like this. Or we could also distribute that 1 fourth and make it look like this. Um, you know, you could have it as 1 fourth x minus 5 fourths. So that's another another way that the problem uh, could be answered or provided there. Did I? Of course I did. All right. No. Okay, so now that we have the inverse function, uh, what you notice is the inverse function, again, is another line. So the domain of that is all real numbers. And remember, the domain of the inverse function is the range of the original function, which we could have figured out anyways because we see that this is a line. The domain and range of a line is always going to be all real numbers. So negative infinity to infinity, and then the range is negative infinity to infinity. All right. Uh, the next one here is f of x equals 2 times the cube root of x plus 4. Now, again, I'm going to kind of cheat. I already know what the cube root function looks like because I was doing my transformations of functions. The cube root function looks like this. That is true for all real numbers. So therefore, just because I have a vertical stretch of 2 and a shift, uh, shift up 4, the domain is still going to be all real numbers, and the range is still going to be all real numbers. So I'm going to cheat and already kind of know my answer. Um, but, you know, the question is also asking, you know, find the inverse. So that might be the, the question that we'll need to provide here. So if I want to find the inverse, I'll replace that with a y. Let's go ahead and swap the variables over here. So therefore, I'll have x equals 2 cube root of y plus 4. 
Okay, now this is usually where a lot of students will, you know, get confused. And remember, we're just solving an equation for y, so we've got to use the inverse operations. So to apply the inverse operations, the first thing I need to do is divide by a 2 on both sides. I'll write that as a 1 half x instead of x divided by 2. And that's going to equal the cube root of y plus 4. Now I need to undo adding 4, so I'll subtract a 4 on both sides. And therefore I have 1 half x minus 4 is equal to the cube root of y. Now to undo cubing, I'm going to cube both sides. So I'll cube both sides. And therefore I have y is equal to, I'll write the y on the left side, is equal to 1 half x minus 4 cubed. Now, obviously, I'd hope your problem, or at least right now, we haven't talked about, you know, expanding a binomial, but that's really just 1 half x minus 4 multiplied by itself three times. So, I mean, it is something you can do, but I am not, I'm just going to leave it in that way. That is a simplified way for me, but then I'll just use my f inverse of x is equal to that. So, 1 half x minus 4 cubed. And again, if we were going to look into the domain of this inverse function, we realize that this is just going to produce a polynomial, right? There's no restrictions of a deno can't divide by zero in the denominator or taking the square root of a radical. So again, the domain of this function, which is the range of my original function, is going to be all real numbers. All right, next example. Now, the next example, we have a restriction. And the reason why we have a restriction is because quadratics are not one-to-one. -one. And if you're trying to find the inverse of a function that is not one-to-one, -one, it's the inverse is not going to be a function. So um, it's either you can't find the inverse as it being a function, or there is a restriction that will make it one-to-one. -one. And again, if we look at this, let's just graph this real quick. So this is one unit to the right, three units up. Quadratic, right? Looks something like that. Okay. So to determine if something is one-to-one, -one, it has to pass the horizontal line test. And this function obviously does not pass the horizontal line test. However, fortunate for us, we have a restriction. Oh, no, the restriction is wrong. That restriction is supposed to be from one. Okay. So what, the, what we're saying is I only want this function to be fine for x values that are less than or equal to one. That means everything to the right of 1 is not within this function. So therefore, we're only dealing with the restriction of this function from negative infinity to 1. Now, that's helpful because I can actually I can define the domain and range here. I know that here, the domain now is from negative infinity to 1. And 1 is included. So let's put a bracket there. And the range I can determine here is going to be from 3 to infinity. I don't like that dot there. So that will be from 3. That's a bad 3. 3 to infinity. All right. Hey, Supremo. Glad you could uh, join. I'll take a little break here in just a second uh, after I'm done with these. So we have 3 to infinity. and uh, But let's go ahead and work on finding the inverse. So let's replace that with y. And let's swap the variables. So therefore, I'll have x equals y minus 1 squared plus 3. Now, when I'm solving for the inverse, I don't really need to worry about the constraint. We'll talk about the constraint here once we have the answer. Um, so to solve for y, before I can do anything with um, inside of the parentheses, I need to get rid of this 3. So I'm going to subtract a 3. So therefore, I'll have x minus 3 is equal to y minus 1 squared. Now, I can get rid of the square root by introducing the plus or minus. Now, it's very, very important for us to understand that um, when you introduce the square root, you have to include plus or minus. All right? Now, so therefore, I have plus or minus x minus 3 is equal to y minus 1. So I'll add a 1 to both sides. And then right over here, let's write it in inverse notation. f inverse of x is equal to... 1 plus or minus the square root of x minus 3. But the problem here is that's not a function. You can't have the plus or minus. You can't have two values here for your or for the x is now going to have two values for the y value. So this isn't going to be a function. So we either need to choose, are we talking about the positive or are we talking about the negative version? 
And what we need to do is look back at our constraints. If you look at this original constraint, it's dealing with the x values that are less than zero. Basically, um, that is a restriction here on the domain. So that's going to be a restriction now on my uh, range here. So I can remove the positive version. And if you want to check to see if that'd be right, let's grab this. So this could also be written like this, negative square root of x minus 3 plus 1. And if, we, if I was to graph this, that is a reflect, that is the square root graph, which again, you know, looks like this, right? So the graph is being reflected about the y-axis, shifted three units to the right, and up one. So one, two, three, up one. And let's make sure, does that graph look like it's a reflection about the y equals x line? Yes, it does, right? If I would have included the positive version, it would have been up there, and you can see that that doesn't work. That doesn't make sense. Um, so therefore, you can see that is how we're going to restrict that with the negative. And again, you can look at the domain range here. The domain is from 3 to infinity, which is the range. Oh, i got to include that as a bracket, not a parenthesis. Let's erase that real quick. So the domain of my inverse function is the range of my function. And you can see that's 3 to infinity, and the range of this is from negative infinity to 1, which is the domain of my function. So good. All right, so for the next one, I don't know why I left so little space here, because this is the one where I actually need the most amount of space. Great. All right, so um, I'll try to do my best here. Maybe I can zoom in and write it stuff a little bit smaller. We'll see. So first step. I'm going to, this is going to be kind of a little sloppy. I'm going to work from left to right. First step, replace with y. All right, swap the variables. So, so therefore, I'm going to have x is equal to 2y minus 3 all over 3y plus 1. Okay, now you're trying to solve for y, right? The, you can't solve for y when it's in your denominator. So to get the y off the denominator, you need to multiply by the denominator on both sides. You've got to make sure you multiply by on both sides. Y plus 1. Kind of right out a little space there. Okay, so when you multiply it on both sides, those divide out to 1. And now we're left with 3y plus 1 times x is equal to 2y minus 3, okay? Now again, we got to solve for y, right? And we have a y on the right side, y on the left side. But before we can get them on the same side, it's going to be helpful to get the y outside of these parentheses. And to get rid of these parentheses, I can just distribute this, this x. So right there, I have a 3yx plus 1 times x, which is x, equals 2y minus 3. Now, to save a little space and time, I am going to do two operations at the same time. So I'm going to subtract a 2y on both sides. And then I'm going to subtract the x on both sides. Okay? So when I do that, I now have on the left side, let's put it over here. I'll write it. 3yx minus 2y. And then on the right-hand side, I'm going to have a negative 3 minus x. Okay, now again, now we have the variables y on the same side. They're not in any parentheses. And typically, we could combine them. But we can't combine them because um, they're not like terms. But what we can do is factor out a y. And when we factor out a y, what we do is we've isolated the y variable to now have 3x minus 2 is equal to a negative 3 minus x. And now, to solve for y, all i got to do is just divide. I'll use a different color again divide by 3x minus 2 on both sides. Okay, And so therefore, I have y is equal to, or f inverse now, is equal to a negative 3 minus x all over 3x minus 2. All right, so now let's talk about the domain, because domain range, because this is really important. In the, all the previous examples, like I know of enough information on each equation that I could sketch the graph and identify the domain and range. However, at this point in our instruction, we haven't really talked about rational expressions as much, and so I'm not really sure as far as the range here. I can identify the domain because the domain is the values that make the denominator equal to zero. And so, you know, identifying the domain here, you just set you know, 3x plus 1 equal to 0. And you see that x is equal to a negative 1 third. 
So a negative one-third is not in the domain. So if I was going to write the domain, it's going to be all real numbers except for negative one-third. So that would be negative infinity to negative one-third, and then union negative one-third to infinity. Okay. Now, if I want to find the range, the easiest thing to do is go to the domain of the inverse and say, all right, what's the domain of the inverse? Well, this is the same thing. The numerator here is a, is a function that is unrestricted, so I don't need to worry about that. But the denominator has certain values that make the denominator equal to zero. So I set the denominator equal to zero. And I see that x is equal to 2 thirds. That makes the denominator equal to zero. So the range of my original function is going to be the domain of the inverse, which is negative infinity to 2 thirds union 2 thirds to infinity. Okay, so again, remember the domain and the ranges are swapped. All right, last but not least, let's go ahead and prove that these two functions are um, inverses of each other, and then I'll go ahead and take a quick little break. Um, all right, so to determine uh, functions are inverses of each other, we need to use composition. And basically, if we plug one function into the other, what we're going to get back, or if you're going to plug, sorry, if you're going to plug a function in, function into its inverse, or its inverse into a function, you're going to get back the identity element x. And so it doesn't matter which operation you go, but as long as two functions are inverses of each other, then you're always going to get back that identity element. So in this case, I don't really need to worry so much about the constraint uh, that's been given to me, x is greater than 0. Um, that's not really going to play in hand, but it is kind of important just to make sure that we understand that we're only looking at that positive version of that graph. So anyways, if I want to, because um, otherwise it wouldn't be a one-to-one -one function and we wouldn't be talking about inverses, we'd have plus or minus over there. So, so let's go ahead and just practice doing composition. So first thing we want to do is do f of g of x. Well, I guess you could do g of f of x too, but let's go ahead and do f of g of x. So what that means, I'm going to take the g of x function and plug it into the f of x function. So that's going to look like square root of x plus 4 squared minus 4. And the square root of something squared is going to be x plus 4 minus 4, which is just equal to x. And that has to equal x. Um, and we want that to equal g of f of x. So let's go and see if that is the same. So g of f of x. All right, so g of f of x, that means I'm going to take the f of x function and plug it into g of x function. So that's going to look like, uh, let's see, x squared minus 4 plus 4. And you can see here we don't really need the parentheses. I can take negative 4 plus 4 is going to give me just x squared. And the square root of x squared is x. So therefore, I'm not really, didn't really write this mathematically correct or show my work here. But you can see here that the all of these equal to x. And then all of these are equal to x. And you can see that x is equal to x. So therefore, it works out. And I'm sorry, my notation here is really bad. But all right, I'm going to take a little break here. I have ace the base. My head hurts just by looking at this. Good luck, man. Hey, well, it's uh, glad to have you here. Supremo, hope you're here. Um, and anybody else that is still here, if you guys have any questions or anything else, um, I'm just going to work through some multiple choice questions. Probably shouldn't take me about five minutes um, going on. And then I'll be more than happy to kind of answer any general questions or questions that you have on your homework. Uh, it is a Friday, you know, school's over. It's, I understand, it's time to the weekend. But we are given a quiz in my class next week. So for my students, I really want to make sure that they, um, you know, have all that information. Hey, Ethan, how are you doing? What is math? Good question, man. I don't know. Just, it's a torture, a torture symbol. Uh, basically, but an honest, an honest reason. There's so much in math that I think we it'd be so much better if we could teach and not have to focus on test and certain things. I mean, 
obviously there's some of the math that you know I think is important for a lot of people to know and especially if you're going into a field you know heavily based on mathematical ideas and skills but you know I think for a majority of people you know they really get stuck in a lot of this you know um, abstract math that we're still forcing a lot of people to do that really I don't think really determines how successful you know they can be um, in school or really in life so um, integrate tan raised to the one third. Oh man, you're already giving me some calculus. It's been a um, tangent is equal to three squared. So we're gonna have to use u substitution um, row. So let me let me go and finish this, and then I'll I'll play around. I using only one substitution. Yeah, you're just gonna use u substitution for that. Um, so tangent squared tangent is secant squared, I believe, if I remember correctly, and then you'll use u substitution. So, um, all right, well, I'll get to that after. Let me go and get the, let me finish up the, for the people that are care about the inverses, I'll finish that up, and then I'll see what I remember on calculus. Even though I taught it for a couple of years, I obviously, you know, have not, not teaching this year. So anyways, focus. Uh, multiple choice, let's go and get this. So in this one, it's just asking for the function f of x equals x cubed plus two, you know, find the inverse. So, all right, all we gotta do is really just work on finding the inverse here. Do I use blue to add it? Okay. Um, let's do something different, let's do blue. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stay, take, uh, replace this with an x equals y cubed plus two. So I'll subtract a two, so I have x minus two equals y cubed, and then I will take the cube root of both sides, so I could have f inverse, that's a cube. So f inverse of x is equal to the cube root of x minus two. Do I find my answer? There we go, c. Uh, the next one, find the function, get, find the range. Ooh. So. So to find the range, that means we can find the domain of the inverse function. So let's see if we can figure out what the inverse function is to find the domain. Oh, that got switched over. Um, all right, so man, I hope I have enough room here. I'll kind of do some work over here. So let's go and swap this with x equals square root of 16 minus y squared minus 5. All right, so I'm going to add a five to both sides. That's so good, okay. So I have x plus five equals the square root of 16 minus, ah, minus y squared. Then I'm going to need to square both sides. Square both sides here, and therefore I could leave that, but I'm going to leave that as it is. So, to square root, that's going to be a circle minus five. Find the range. Oh, you know what? That's a bad. It's a bad example because this is going to give me a semicircle, and it's not going to be to find the inverse. Dang it. Okay. Well. Um. This is not going to work algebraically, but let's I'll see what it. I actually played with this. This is a bad question actually for me, for at least my students, because we actually haven't covered this. Because then you're for you're not going to be able to solve this as y. So this actually doesn't. Um, it's it's not one to one. The inverse is not going to have a range. You can still it doesn't have an inverse to be able to find it because I'll I'll show you what this graph looks like. Um, well, it does have an inverse. It's just not a function. So what am I doing there? So therefore, we will subtract 16, subtract 16, and so we have x plus 5 squared minus 16 equals negative y squared, and then divide by negative 1, divide by negative 1. So I have y squared equals, and so what I'll see, I'll show you what this looks like. Um, y squared divided by negative 1, so that's going to be positive 16 minus x plus 5 squared. And the reason why this doesn't have an inverse, as you can see, is now I need to take the square root, right? So as I take the square root on both sides, I'm now going to have y equals 
plus or minus the square root of 16 minus x plus 5 squared. Okay, now, um, so that is not going to work as far as finding the range that way. So as far as the inverse, that's not going to work. Now, technically what this is, is this is a semicircle with a radius of 4. So 1, 2, 3, um, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's actually what the graph looks like. Well, that's what um, 16 minus x squared looks like, and then you're being shifted down 5. So therefore, it's going to be down to negative 1. And then it's asking us for the range. So that's going to be from negative 5 to negative 1. So that is the answer, but that's by knowing what the graph is. And my students do not know what this graph is yet. So it's a bad question, so I apologize for that. Um, in terms of finding the inverse, you can see that this wouldn't work finding the inverse because the function, the inverse is not a function. It's not one to one. So using the process of inverses would not work for that. So I apologize, students. Um, I will have to make sure I note that for the people that are not watching the live stream. All right, for the next one, it says f inverse of four. So find the inverse. So um, in this case, basically we just need to find the inverse and then plug in four. So I have x equals the square root of three t minus one. Oops, not t. Let's use that as uh, a y because I want to solve for that. Even though using t in replacement of x, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so first thing I want to do is square both sides. So again, I'm going to have to do my work like left to right. So sorry about that. Um, so therefore, I'll have x squared equals 3 my y minus 1. To simplify this, I'll add a 1 to both sides. There I'll have x squared plus 1 equals 3y. Divide by 3 on both sides. And then I'll have f inverse is of t, I guess. I'm just going to use x. Is equal to uh, x squared plus 1 over 3. And again, it doesn't really matter because I'm looking in for what is f inverse of 4, right? So I'm just going to plug 4 in for x, or you could plug 4 in for t. It doesn't really matter in this case. That's going to give me 16 plus 1 over 3, uh, which is 17 thirds. Answer A. All right, in the last example here, um, I forgot to do challenge problems, so I guess I'm going to have to re-upload uh, this document for our students. I don't do the challenge on the live streams anyways. So find the inverse of the function f of x equals 1 over x minus 2. So again, same process. What we're going to do is we're going to swap the x's and the y's. So that's 1 over, remember, just replace that with a y. And that's going to be y minus 2. You need to get the y off the denominator. So I'll multiply by y minus 2. And then, so those divide out. So now you're left with y minus 2 times x equals 1. Now again, to solve for y here, I've got to get it outside the parentheses, so I need to distribute that x, so therefore it's yx minus 2x equals 1. And then how does to solve for y? Um, you don't need to factor out the x, you can just get the x, add the 2x to the other side. So now you have yx is equal to 1 plus 2x, and then divide by x. So therefore I have y is equal to 1 plus 2x over x, and I'm not seeing my answer, right? But if you distribute that x to the 1 as well as to the 2x, you'd have 1 over x plus 2. And obviously, you could replace y with f inverse. And you guys can see that is answer number b. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is at least the homework here for inverses of functions. Sorry again about question number two. That is a bad example that I provided, so I'll need to fix that. Um, but, you know, besides that, everything else is really just following, you know, swapping the x and the y's, solving for y, uh, making sure that your function is one-to-one, -one, so therefore you can find the inverse, making sure that you understand that the range of the inverse is the, do I'm sorry, the domain of the function is the range of the inverse, and the range of the function is the domain of the inverse. So the quick tip, you know, that to find the range of a function, just find the domain of its inverse. Um, but that's kind of it. Now what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and take a look at some questions here in the live stream to spend a little time. Don't really have much time. i got to go, but let me go and see what else we have here. 
All right, so, Raul just got a lot. All right, you don't even need to find the domain of square root of 16. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's therefore subtracting 5 from both sides. Yeah, you don't, I don't know why I was working on the domain. Um, I don't know, Raul, why I was doing all that. Um, I was just kind of working my way through, I guess, because basically I wanted to, well, really, what I really wanted to show students is, again, you know, once you get into this, right, so I noticed the mistake early on. But what I, not the mistake, but the issue with this. But I wanted to get to the point of students seeing why this was not going to be a function, why the inverse was not going to be a function. And then, because if I just showed them what the semicircle is, they're going, how'd you know that was a semicircle, right? Um, so I wanted to show them mathematically why there's an issue with finding the uh, inverse here, because the inverse is not a function. Um, so then again, you can use that in your idea of, you know, understanding the semicircle and just the transformations. But yes, I do appreciate it. I wasn't, kind of caught me off guard, so I was kind of like, I let me the best I could. Um, he, yeah, C is the answer. C is the answer, negative five to infinity. Uh, I'm not sure in finding the range, negative five to infinity. I don't see that that graph is continuing from negative five, um, continuing down. I'm seeing this going from negative five to one. But I guess we could plot it into a graph and kind of see um, what the range is. Hey, Demarcus, <laughs> glad you could answer in here. Uh, so, Earl, did you still want to do the, so, I mean, are you agreeing with me that negative 5, 1? I don't want to um, pop up, but I'm pretty sure if we go into Desmos here and graph this, this is the semicircle from 0 to 5, from 0 to 4. So if we shift it down 5 units, it should be from negative 5 to negative 1. Um, if you agree with that, let me know. Otherwise, um, let's, let me go. Uh, Well, let's go ahead and play around with your other equation that you had here. Sorry about that. Uh, let's go and practice with the tan of x. So let's do y equals tan of x. And then raised to the one third. So if I wanted to find um, this, what I can basically look at is this is really going to be y equals the of some function raised to the one third. So the first thing I'd want to do is use the power rule. Um, and basically, then I'm going to take the derivative of my inside function. Okay, so whatever the inside function doesn't matter, but you can see there's a function inside of another function. So um, first thing I'm going to do is just going to go ahead and take the derivative here. So y prime of, I'll just, rep, I'll just keep the box there, I'll just use tan of x. Oh, well, let's do y prime. So therefore, uh, again, noting the uh, power rule, I'm going to bring down the one third, and then we'll have tangent of x, and then remember you subtract one from the power, so therefore it's going to be a negative two thirds, and then I need to multiply this by the derivative of tangent of x, which is, I believe, it's been a long time, secant, of, secant squared of x. And then obviously I can rewrite the negative two-thirds in the bottom. So that for, that'd be, so it'd really be um, one over three tangent of positive two-thirds times secant squared of x. And really, that's in the numerator, so you can take the secant, put it up top, and if you wanted to, or if you were asked to, you could also rewrite the tangent as, you know, with the cube. So therefore, we'd have secant squared of x all over 3 times the cube root of tangent squared of x. So that just would be another you know, way that the answer um, could go ahead and be represented. So hopefully that helps, and hopefully I remember all my uh, derivative skills, some things. Uh, yesterday, so that's the chain rule. What is, did I say chain rule, substitution? Yeah, chain, chain rule. I, don't, I think I was talking, like I said, you like miss out on your, you know, I'm starting to mix it up. But yes, it's the chain rule. Not, I, I think I was using the substitution. I mean, basically the chain rule, yeah, you're not substituting in your, the chain rule. Thanks, man. I, I'm losing my mind. Um, thank you so much. You are very welcome, Del. Um, 
Sorry, but I asked the integration, not differentiation. Oh, oh, integrate. You are very much correct. Okay. I don't know why, man. Um, integrate tan raised to the one-third. Um, integrate, integrate, integrate. I'm trying to think and tangent would on to the one-third. Again, you'd probably want to be looking into um, possibly the... You know, to be honest, I just don't. I'd have to go back and look at my notes. I apologize. It's I spent the two years with the uh, calculus and uh, reteaching it, and um, I don't see any issues with the the tangent raised to the one third. Uh, you know, looking at doing u substitution with that um, is the possibility. But um, also, I've been teaching all day, and my brain kind of hurts, and then doing two live streams for an hour. Uh, I'm not sure on the correct, and obviously I don't want to make you know any mistakes or or lead you into a different area. Um, obviously, if I was a little bit more active in the calculus right now, it probably wouldn't be an issue. But uh, I, I apologize. I'm real, you know, my recommendation would just be you know go ahead and check out um, you know Mathway and kind of see the answer, and then you know kind of see if you can work you know backwards from that. Because um, otherwise, I would you know probably spend about five minutes uh, probably working on it and refresh my memory on things. But I don't want to waste time, you know, with people in the live stream, just uh, me thinking through it because it's not popping right in front of my brain right now. And that's due to a couple of reasons, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to spend anybody's time for me to go back and try to remember what I was uh, just doing or look back at my notes to refresh my memory. So sorry about that. But guys, I'm going to uh, end this live stream. I really appreciate you joining in. And let's see, next week I am... Next week, we're going to be taking some quizzes, so I'm probably not going to resume. I actually, I'll resume my live stream next week. I'll do a, uh, I'll do a uh, live stream over the quiz that I give my students. So we'll probably, fit, we'll do a live stream probably at the end of week, maybe like a week from, maybe like next Wednesday or Thursday, I'll probably do a live stream. So, um, you know, I'll try to do that around like 3 o'clock if you guys are interested. And then, um, and then yeah, and then we'll start, uh, the next chapter is going to be polynomials. So, Hopefully I can uh, help you out. What a bomb. Well, hey, Merrill, I've, sorry, man, oh, sorry. I wish I could answer every single question that everybody gives me every single time, the first thing, but it's just unrealistic that I'm always going to have an answer uh, available for every question. So I apologize for that. I know that's, you know, probably what you're waiting and coming here for was to, uh, you know, get your answers, questions. Um, but, uh, you know, right now it's on unavailable. So I apologize, man. Um, you know, if, if you, not even in pre-calculus or algebra two or geometry, I'm not going to be able to answer, you know, every kind of question. So, um, you know, maybe if you I'll look into it and, you know, hopefully refresh a little memory and I'll be there. But anyways, guys, cheers. Um, talk to you on next stream.